Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our virtual event, Wired for Thought, Breakthroughs in Brain, Computer, and Cognitive Science. Earlier this year, Tufts University received a transformative donation, one that positions Tufts to be a leader in cognitive and brain science research and innovation. Today's event is both a celebration of that gift and a launch of a new era at Tufts. One of our panelists today is Tufts alumnus Jeff Steibel. Earlier this year, Jeff and his partners made possible the creation of the Steibel Dennett Consortium for Brain and Cognitive Science by donating their company BrainGate Inc. and its pat patented technology to Tufts. As part of this gift, Jeff also established two faculty positions to support this important work inspired by his positive undergraduate experience at Tufts. I am truly grateful for Jeff's and his partner's generous gesture. And as a scientist myself, I am energized by the possibilities that lie ahead. Today's conversation explores both the present and the future of brain science, the research underway, the emerging technologies, and the implications for our society. This is a timely and important conversation, not just at Tufts. We are now the stewards of these seminal patents in brain-computer interfaces, but for all of us. I am grateful that you have chosen to join us today, and I am pleased to welcome Jim Glazer, Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences, to share more and introduce our speakers. Thank you. Thank you, President Monaco. I'm thrilled to be part of this event celebrating the gift of BrainGate and the establishment of the Steibel Dennett Consortium for Brain and Cognitive Science. As Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences at Tufts, I am so proud when I talk about our faculty. In addition to the gift of BrainGate and the new consortium, Jeff Steibel has created two new professorships specifically to support brain and cognitive science. I am thrilled that you'll be hearing from the inaugural holders of these two positions. Gina Cooperberg, a longtime member of the Tufts community and head of the Tufts Neurocognition Lab, is a respected scholar in the field of language processing and has recently been appoint appointed the Dennett Steibel Professor of Cognitive Science. We were also able to recruit Stephanie Bodd, who began at Tufts this semester an innovative researcher exploring how the brain understands and informs our movement. She is the inaugural Steibel Family Assistant Professor of Brain and Cognitive Science. Gifts to support professorships strengthen our ability to attract and retain the most talented faculty, who in turn inspired generations of students. I know that Jeff's gift was in fact inspired by his own interactions with Tufts faculty while he was a student here, specifically university professor Daniel Bennett, who we will also be hearing from later in this program. Many of you joining us today are here because you know or know of Dan, one of our most esteemed faculty members and a giant in the field of philosophy and cognition. It brings me great joy to see Dan honored through this gift as well. Jeff and his partners at BrainGate felt that Tufts University would be a good home for this priceless gift, and I would agree. Faculty research and scholarship, like the kind we'll hear about today, can create direct and positive change in the world. With this gift, we look forward to doing just that. I'd now like to turn things over to our live panel, who will kick off our discussion on breakthroughs in brain computer and cognitive science. Please welcome Bob Cook, Dean of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, who will serve as our moderator, Mike Levin, Vannevar Bush, Distinguished Professor in Biology and a Tufts alum, and Tan Lee, author of The Neuro Generation and founder and president of Emotive Systems. And finally, my good friend, and Tufts alum, Jeff Steibel. Thank you. 
All right. Thank you, President Monaco and Dean Glazer. Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Bob Cook. I'm the Dean of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. I'm also a professor in the Department of Psychology, and I'm your host for today. We're thrilled that you're here for our first event related to the establishment of the Steibel Dennett Consortium, Wired for Thought. Today, we'll be offering up an hour of information with some of the leading scholars in this area here at Tufts. Besides several upcoming video presentations, we are joined by the following wonderful live panel for today's event. So uh, let's have each of the panelists introduce themselves. Can you uh, say a bit about your experience in the field of cognitive and brain sciences and broadly uh, your experiences in brain computer interfaces and technology? Why, Tan, why don't we start with, with you? Sure, thank you, Bob. Thank you and welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to join you today. Um, I've been in the field for over 10 years now, and we focus primarily on electroencephalography, EEG for short, which is much e easier to say. It's a form of non-invasive um, measurement of brain activity. And obviously there are many different ways that we can image uh, what's going on in the brain. If we're trying to think about a simple analog of, of a map when you're visiting a new city, fMRI gives you the, the spatial resolution to know where all of the buildings are, where the stadium is, where the schools are, where the homes are, and the residential areas. But EEG offers you the information around the dynamics of that system, how people are moving around, you know, in the morning dropping off their kids at school and then going to work. That kind of information is what we actually capture with EEG. Um, and we now support tools. Um, we offer tools to support neuroscientific research in 120 countries. In it's specifically around brain computer interface. Uh, one of the most prominent demonstrations that we did was um, with a man who was paralyzed from the neck down um, from a carjacking incident in Brazil. And he was able to drive a Formula One car around a racetrack just using uh, his mind and our machine learning algorithms. No, that's amazing. Uh, Mike, why don't you go next? Thank you so much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, so I direct the Allen Discovery Center at Tufts. And one of the things that my group is very interested in is how uh, cells and collections of cells make decisions. So all of the cells in your body make decisions when they work together to build complex organs, to repair those organs, and to resist aging. And we discovered years ago that many of those conversations are electrical in nature. So all cells in the body communicate electrically, and it is our job to be able to read out and uh, translate those conversations so that we can understand how cells cooperate towards these amazing morphogenetic feats. So our goal is to um, use this technology and technologies like it to be able to listen in to these electrical conversations, to decode them, and then to drive applications in fields like regenerative medicine, uh, cancer reprogramming, and even uh, synthetic morphology or building novel um, artificial living machines. All of this relies on understanding what the cells are saying to each other. And being able to read these uh, electrical signals is a, um, a huge part of that. So I'm super excited about this. All right, and and uh, last but not least, Jeff, why don't you why don't you introduce yourself and and why don't you share a little bit more about the BrainGate technology that you've stewarded with our audience so they know more about the details of it? Sure, ha happy to, Bob. And uh, um, I, I am I am probably least and at least least interesting uh, from the perspective of what's being done in you know on the forward side with brain science. Um, because you know my my background in in the brain is a bit dated about 20 years uh, so or so uh, started my you know my academic studies at Tufts uh, you know uh, got a degree in cognitive sciences and then went on to graduate school to study the brain and cognitive sciences uh, but uh, for better or worse I went to the dark side and left with a couple other professors and uh, and started in business and ran a number of consumer internet companies and have been doing that for the most part ever since. Uh, but, uh, but always continued to follow and track what was happening in the brain. Uh, and uh, in that field, have written a couple of books, have continued to do, uh, do some independent research and stay active in the research community. And BrainGate had always fascinated me. It was a technology that originally emerged from a commercial standpoint out of Brown University where I was in graduate school. Uh, it moved into a commercial space. Unfortunately, it just wasn't viable at the time, uh, but it was pushed into a public company, uh, grew at least in terms of perception, 
but not in terms of, of actual ability. So as, you know, as that technology continued to evolve and advance, but the business did not, me and my colleagues ended up acquiring the business uh, and I became chairman. Uh, and uh, up until the donation of, of the BrainGate technology and business to Tufts University, uh, I remained chairman of that business. Uh, BrainGate is a remarkable technology and it in many ways sits in between the commercial efforts that, you know, that Tom and, and her company has done and the work that, uh, that Mike has done. Uh, so, I mean, th this, this is an incredibly interesting panel from that perspective because what BrainGate effectively does is, is it leverages an, a computer chip to record the neuronal activity, the electrical signals um, inside the brain. So not from outside, but inside, which gives you a much better signal to noise ratio and allows you to decode the language of the brain. And this is really the first time that we've been able to do this, not just with animals, but with humans as well. And once you do that, it enables a really deep level of understanding on the research side, but, uh, but equally important, it, it allows us to interpret that language, convert it into computer or machine language, uh, and then use that information to provide feedback, uh, which will allow a, you know, a, a quadriplegic or, or paraplegic um, to use a wheelchair as an example, uh, for someone who's missing a limb to control a prosthetic, uh, or for someone who is a locked in patient who can't speak or communicate to you know, say, I love you to their loved ones for the first time ever, uh, it, typing an email with nothing but their mind. So it really is transformative technology. Uh, it has been proven now in, you know, in human and animal trials, uh, and, you know, and Tufts is now at the forefront of that next generation. Uh, that's that is great. One of the important con uh, developments from this is uh, the fact that the, the Stiebel Dennett Consortium was uh, related to brain and cognitive sciences was created, and now you know, you've had a chance to to meet Jeff Stiebel. Uh, here's our opportunity to meet and hear from Dr. Dan Dennett. Dan is one of the world's leading philosophers and has had highly influential ideas related to cognitive and brain sciences and the notion of consciousness, along with numerous other important contributions. Because of this event, I recently had the great privilege to speak with uh, Dr. Dennett about some of these issues and their relationship to brain gate technology. I would like to share a portion of that conversation and then we'll get the pan panel's reactions uh, to what Dan had to, to observe. And in this segment, Dan and I were discussing the relationship between humanity and our long historical connection to the use of technology and some of the benefits and concerns about direct connections between our brains and technology. So let's take a couple minutes to, to play that segment. Well, a lot of the benefits will be not so much for us on the research end as for people in the world who will find their jobs easier because they won't have to push as many buttons and turn as many levers, and dials because, because of a simple brain link which will enable them to do that. Now, that in itself, I don't think, is a revolutionary development. Um, for hundreds of years, people have used hand tools to understand the world, to feel the world. The, the blind man's cane is, is a fine example. It's as if, it's as if his fingers extended right out to the, right out to the road. I can tell textures and and uh, uh, all kinds of things like that. So where I see the direct brain prosthesis interface as a, not a revolutionary development, but as a more gradual development, but a very important one. And which aspects will reign? Interesting question. One thing I'm actually worried about is who's going to be in control? Attention is the key to control. Who controls your attention controls you to a surprising degree. And right now there are many agents, many corporations, many activities in the world that are dead set on controlling your attention. On your, on your smartphone, on your computer. And 
for me, one of the most important things we have to do is learn to protect our own attention from these lures, from these attractors, because they're very dangerous and, and they're tremendously potent. We don't want other people pulling our strings and turning us into puppets. We've got to control our own strings, and that takes some serious work. And I guess one of the things I would really like to see is technology which helps the individual empower herself or himself to keep those attention draggers at bay and help us concentrate on what really needs to get done. If we can do that, we will have a wonderful invention. So Jeff, what, what do you think about Dan's uh, observations about brain computer interfaces? Are they just an, an inevitable gradual development that had to happen or are they revolutionary? I mean, is there is that something you can agree with or is, is he missing something important here? I, I, I mean, I, I would say like, like with much of what Dan says, there, there's a lot to be unpacked there. Um, and uh, and he, he's, He's right in so in so many ways. I think what you've got to do is you've, you've got to separate the, the the actual device or innovation um, from the impact that it is going to make to the human mind, uh, b both from a perception standpoint and a reality standpoint. The, the, the actual invention isn't anything interesting. All we're doing is tapping into the electrical currents of, of the brain, right? The, the brain communicates using electrical right. and, and chemical currents. We're tapping into those and we're using neural networks to interpret what those, you know, what that information tells us. Uh, it is not revolutionary or it's no more revolutionary uh, than when we extend, when we extended our, our, you know, hands and limbs using, using tools, um, which at the time was revolutionary in hindsight, it doesn't feel that way. Or when, you know, when we came up with bispectals or glasses to extend our ability to see. Um, what is remarkable and revolutionary is the fact that our brains aren't nearly as special as we thought. Uh, and, and that is the thing that I think individuals are gonna grapple with psych psychologically, that we don't actually have complete control of our minds uh, because it is, you know, it is a composite of cells. And you know, I think this is what, you know, what Mike has taken to the logical conclusion um, frankly, logical uh, in hindsight, I didn't see this, uh, but it's not even just the brain. Uh, it's, you know, it's our cellular composition as a whole that creates the cell organism um, to be able to do things and to change and to interact. And I think what Dan is speaking to is something so much more broad than BrainGate, um, but BrainGate is, is such a clear risk factor in it, which is we are rapidly losing control of our self of our attention. And as you do that, because of technology coming inbound, as opposed to us controlling it, there is increasing danger as this technology gets closer and closer to going from hardware to wetware. So, so Mike, you have a, a long history of, of looking at the, the actions of cells as a, as a unit, and Jeff makes reference to the brain. Is this, uh, given your perspective as a developmental biologist, does, did this seem inevitable, this, this evolution of, of brain computing interfaces? Well, uh, this actually, this idea that uh, cognition is not just a property of the brain and that there is some degree of memory, decision-making, attention, all of the things that Dan spoke about, that this is actually an ancient uh, uh, set of capacities that evolution found very early on, actually probably around the time of bacterial biofilms. And this has been to a large extent forgotten, you know, as neuroscience has taken, uh, taken off, um, a massive amount of attention, rightly so, is placed on the brain, but the field of basal cognition is, is just uh, sort of re-emerging. And uh, these kinds of technologies that are going to help us uh, bridge the um, the continuum between uh, very very sort of early primitive systems, slime molds, and and you know various tissues of your body, and then uh, elaborate brains. Uh, th this is critical. This is critical technology for understanding the relationship of brain to body, and for actually starting to understand how information is processed both in the brain and outside the brain. This is exactly the kind of technology that we need to be able to listen in on all of the conversations that these cells are having with each other. 
So, so Tom, in 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 the in Dan's segment, he provocatively says something about uh, the the people who control our attention control us. I, I'd love to get your view of that of that statement. Has Facebook, Amazon, has our smartphones? Have they just captured the world by by capturing our attention? I think it's very provocative. And and to to really unpack that, I think we first need to understand that our attentional system works very much like a single channel. So if something holds your attention, you're not able to apply it towards something else. So the other sensory inputs are actively suppressed while you're attending to that particular input until something else like an elephant walks into a room demands your attention, right? And so this, this but at the same time, attention is also very fickle. And so you know, a clearly Facebook with what now what, 2.7, um, billion monthly active users. It certainly, in that sense, has captured the world. But I think the word control here is something that we need to be thoughtful about as well, because um, from a statistical standpoint, yes, but not in the particular. So um, it is able to, inf from a statistical standpoint, it's able to influence the world, the things that you see, the information that you, you have access to, but it doesn't actually control what you actually do. So you watch a dictator, for example, you're glued to the screen, you're, it pulls your attention, but doesn't necessarily mean that you will do exactly what that person will say. And so from, from a, that particular standpoint, I think we still have a lot of um, autonomy and that's where, I think this is very exciting frontier, what we're doing with BrainGate, with some of the neurotechnologies, with what Mike is doing, with what we're doing on the non-invasive side. Technology is allowing us to change our relationship with our brains and allowing us to change our understanding and allowing us to see for the first time what, how our attention is being utilized and, and I'm calling that to attention. So the analog for me is a little bit similar to EKG. So in the past, we, we looked at what, you know, how the heart was performing and now we have them, you know, in our Apple watches and we can start to, it calls to our attention what's happening. And the same thing is happening um, with, the, with neurotechnology and our relationship with our brain. And that evolution is very exciting. Um, hopefully it will allow us to, to do what Dan had talked about, which is be more aware of how our attentional triggers are being pulled. Thank you. So and, uh, let's, why don't we go to uh, another segment of, our com of my conversation with Dan. At, at this point uh, in our conversation, Dan began to raise some important ethical uh, issues and questions that I think uh, this kind of technology uh, provokes. So why don't we play that segment and, uh, and then we'll come back and get everyone's reaction. I think one of the reasons as a philosopher that I'm so much engaged in this field is that I think it raises important ethical issues, social issues. I think we're, uh, it's hard to, uh, to overemphasize the effects this can have and the uh, ways in which these technologies and the political power and corporate power behind them uh, um, threaten many things that, that we hold dear. I think we should be extremely vigilant about the use of technologies. And also at the same time, we should be looking for ways to use the technologies to protect us from, from them. It's a, it's a sort of iterative process. When, when many years ago, when George Smith and I here at Tufts started the curricular software studio, um, we said, look, there's, there's two ways that a computer can give you power. There's the uh, bulldozer way and there's the Nautilus machine way. The bulldozer way, you're still a 98 pound weakling, but you can, you can move a hill. Uh, the Nautilus machine is a technology which makes you personally stronger. And our goal at the software studio was to create, in effect, Nautilus machines for the mind. And I think that's a, that's a project that we should resume uh, full bore now and think about ways in which we can harness this fabulous technology to strengthen our own ability to avoid the, uh, the junk and the, and the misuse of time that 
the rest of the technology is trying to induce in us. Jeff, I know you have some strong opinions about the, the ex ethics of this technological development, for, especially in the area of, for helping people. Do you want to elaborate more on your, your thinking in that area? Yeah, sure. And, and I think Dan largely encapsulated the, the risk as well as the opportunity. I mean, with any technology, it's, it's a two-sided coin. And, you know, on the one hand, you, you, you always have the inevitable extremists, um, usually quite smart, quite intelligent, um, who, who at the first sight of a new technology, um, you know, scream, you know, scream bloody murder and, you know, and assume fear. It, Socrates is the great example, right? I mean, the, the technology of his day was the written word. Uh, and, you know, he, he refused to let himself or any of his students write because he thought that that technology would corrupt the youth, uh, the mind of the youth. Um, and, you know, as, as we've learned, that was more of a Nautilus technology than a bulldozer technology, to use Dan's analogy. Um, it, 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 is, it is the single reason why me and my team at BrainGate decided to donate this technology to Tufts, uh, because we're, we're business people. And we know what our jobs are in business. And you know, in business, our jobs are to create opportunities with technology, to leverage that technology to increase revenues and profitability. And if you just think back to the early days of technology, it's exactly what we did. And you know, Bob, we we we, we were leveraging your field more than you know more than leveraging computer technology. We we found tricks that we could implement. Um, that that inevitably brought people closer and closer to our technology so that they would buy more and more. And, and those tricks eventually stole the attention of the mind away from the individual and towards what whatever the technology was or whatever we wanted. And what we learned with those tricks was that there was, there was actually a predictable thesis and pattern for doing this. And it, it came down to data. And if we could control and command enough data that was personalized and narrow, we could gain anyone's attention because we know that the most important word in the human language is your name, whatever that is. And if we could get to your name and what you wanted, you know, what, what, uh, what in business is sometimes called the long tail, um, but what we really mean by that is what you and no one else wants, something so targeted and so defined uh, we will be able to control your, you know, control your attention, and we can use that for good, or we can use that for bad. Uh, in, in business, we're not looking to use it for any other purpose other than to make money. We, we, BrainGate has the potential to take that one step further. We we are inside your mind, um, and when that is being used as as a common good to help paraplegics and quadriplegics and locked in patients. That's one thing. Uh, and and I, I see very little downside in pushing this technology forward in that capacity. When, when you start using this for, for the broader good, um, so that, you know, so that Mike uh, is going to have a, you know, a brain gate device embedded in his mind, uh, and we start thinking about whether this is going to help him bulldoze uh, or it's going to help him build through, you know, through repetition and Nautilus exercise, uh, that's not our place to answer. It's not the business people's place. It's not the engineer's place. Business is designed to determine how much money you can make. Engineers are designed to determine how you can build it in the most efficient manner. It's not the scientist's decisions. Scientists are, are there to figure out how and whether something is possible. Uh, it, it, it's, it's for philosophers and ethicists uh, to tell us. And, you know, and part of this tough donation comes with the promise that we will be thinking about these problems you know, with, with foresight not in hindsight. But of course, as you mentioned, some of, some of these kinds of, of direct brain links could become cognitive enhancers for a select few who can afford that. How, how can we afford not, uh, how do we avoid uh, uh, dividing society into those who can afford this kind of technology or uh, from those who can't? Well, I mean, look, I've, I've had one for the last three years and it hasn't done that much for me. <laughs> Kidding. In, 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 all, in all seriousness, um, I, I, think, I think that's a really good question. And, you know, it, it's, a, it, it's a fitting question, you know, in 2020, because we do have a, you know, a socioeconomic crisis on our hands between haves and haves not in, nots in so many areas. Uh, and cognition is, of course, one of them. 
And, you know, as we move towards a more intellectual workforce long term, uh, where, you know, where knowledge workers are being, to some extent, overvalued uh, and other areas are being either undervalued or replaced, uh, it, is, it is something we, we have to think about, seriously. not just who should have this because it will provide an advantage, uh, but but also um, who who might be forced to have this uh, to you know to be pushed into that advantaged position. So th there are a lot of dynamics at, at play <clears throat> that that we've got to think about very broadly uh, in advance of commercialization. I totally agree with Jeff um, on that point, and I actually think that you know as technologists we tend to focus on the access question. How do we make things smarter? faster but cheaper more affordable so that we can get it out to as many people as we can but what we often miss in that access um, equation is to think about the inclusion um, and and what what jeff alluded to in terms of the data piece and, and we're seeing that uh, as we amass larger and larger data sets is the diversity that exists in the world um, it, when 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 the brain where the brain is concerned and so that that question around brain diversity being able to ensure that our data sets are actually inclusive and representative of the population but also our business models um, allow people to take part in wealth creation so that we don't create that um, amplify that divide that we're already seeing is really really important and thinking about that in a deliberate manner and offering stewardship around how do we engineer and create new businesses that are more ethical um, in its approach in thinking about um, technology both from an access and inclusion standpoint is really really important Right. So um, uh, during our conversation, um, with, uh, during my conversation with Dan, one of the issues that uh, that, that came up uh, was uh, that you have a collaborate. He has a collaboration going with one of our panelists, Mike Levin. And um, during our conversation, we talked about how uh, Dan's ideas of the intentional stance, the fact that uh, taking the view that inanimate objects and other parts of the world can be understood as if they have uh, intentions, uh, even if they, they don't, uh, ha have been applied to the idea of developmental biology. So Mike, could you say a little bit more about your work with Dan and, and, and how the intentional stance or things like that uh, related to cognition have impacted your thinking about biological systems and, um, and, and what your collaboration has, has produced so far? Sure. Um, actually, Dan's work has been uh, absolutely instrumental in my thinking for years about this uh, this, this field because one of the things that um, he's really uh, developed is this idea for how to uh, understand cognitive agents, so systems that think about things, that make predictions, that have memory, that represent uh, counterfactual events, and so on. How to think about these things in uh, ways that are independent from their implementation. So, so people are very comfortable with saying that, okay, a situated brain in the, in the body can think and can have memory, but as soon as you try to use those terms in other kinds of systems, maybe it's an engineered robot or maybe it's a, um, it's a creature that, that manages problem solving without a brain, then people get very uncomfortable and they say, well, that's not true cognition. That's sort of, um, you're, you're misusing the word. It's sort of as if cognition and then, and then humans and maybe some great apes have this, have this real cognition. And so one of the things that, um, that Dan's work has been really, uh, really influential in is to really very logically uh, and very clearly take apart all of the assumptions that go into these things and really examine the philosophical foundations of under what circumstances we can or should ascribe these sorts of in, the, the, these, these sorts of intentional uh, uh, words to uh, active agents in the world. And the idea is not to anthropomorphize uh, simple systems. The idea is exactly the opposite. It's to dispel the the the, the mystery or or the magic that we sort of assume that okay, you know, humans have this kind of magical uh, ability to think, and then and then other things, you know, we just sort of we shouldn't we shouldn't um, talk as if as if they have it. And if you take evolution seriously, as as Dan has certainly done, then you have to ask yourself, well, where did these capacities come from, and how far back do they extend? And should we really be sw swapping out this notion of real cognition for sort of as if cognition for a continuum? And uh, and this is the kind of thing that Dan and I has been, have been working on. So I work on this in the lab and then 
um, with Dan, we've been uh, we've been discussing some of the uh, some of the, the the philosophical and conceptual uh, things that have to get clear in tr in in order to define, for example, what is a decision, right? So when you have a system and it might be something like a mechanical clock and it does certain things, and you wouldn't really say that's a decision, but then you have um, you know you have you have humans who can who can think deeply about things and and make considered decisions. And then you have systems in between. So all kinds of uh, uh, organisms with brains, without brains, I mean, plants, all sorts of things that can choose among multiple options based on things that have happened to them in the past and things that are happening far away um, or, or, or even in the future that they can anticipate. So uh, this is what Dan and I are working on is to establish a, a rigorous uh, conceptual foundation for understanding mind in all sorts of implementations. Because I, I really think, and I think this technology actually is going to be critical to this development because it'll be very important in uh, uh, combining th novel types of bodies, so biologically created structures with computer interfaces. I think we're going to be surrounded soon uh, in our lifetimes, I think, by uh, an incredible variety of active agents. Some of them will be fully robotic, some of them will be partly biological. There's going to be um, a massive explosion in the kinds of uh, the kinds of agents that we're surrounded with, you know, Internet of Things and, and various soft body robotics and so on. And we we really have to develop a mature understanding of cognition in these unusual implementations and a matching uh, set of ethics that uh, that will guide how we treat other creatures that look very different from us and that um, have cognitive behaviors but don't look anything like us. And this is this is a really important extension of, of, of both the ethics and the sort of philosophy of mind field. And, and it's interesting, Mike, I, I can I can think of a of a radical idea and experiment that that, that will be radical to probably everyone but you and Dan, where you take a brain gate chip and rather than insert it into the motor cortex as we do now, You'd insert, you insert it into the thigh um, or into, you know, into the arm and you listen to cells there. Um, and if you can predict some amount of thought from what is happening in those cells that are communicating with one another, uh, then you, you've effectively proven that thesis that, that you know, the, our, our notion of where thought is derived of in, you know, in humans and animals uh, is, you know, is probably misplaced. Well, I think that's a, a great summary. And so I, I will thank you, uh, panel, for a fantastic exploration of, of, of these ideas. At least it's the beginning of an important conversation. Uh, if you want to hear more of my conversation with Dan Dennett, uh, please visit the Stiebel Dennett Consortium site in the next few days where the entire discussion uh, will be uh, available. I now would like to introduce a, a video presentation of research currently being uh, undertaken at Tufts as a direct result of Jeff Stiebel's gift to the university. The first part outlines uh, the research of professors, uh, Professor Bod uh, in the Department of Psychology, which will be followed up by a, a, a presentation by Dr. Gina Kupenberg uh, from the same department. We hope you find them informative as to the cutting edge research that's being done here at the university. Uh, when those presentations are over, we will return. The panel will be here to answer your questions. So please use this opportunity uh, to submit questions and we'll have a live Q&A uh, after uh, Stephanie and Gina's presentation. So why don't we start those two? Thank you, Bob. Stephanie, it's great to see you. I'll let you take it away. Hello, Gina. Hello, everybody. My name is Stephanie Bade, and since September 1st, I'm the Steibel Family Assistant Professor of Brain and Cognitive Science at Tufts University. In the next minutes, I will give you an overview over my research topic and how it relates to BrainGate. But before I start, I would like to ask you to literally sit on one of your hands while I'm speaking. In my research, I investigate how we perceive the world and our bodies through the different senses. In this moment, your sense of touch indicates the pressure of your body on your hand. You hear my voice through your ears and the computer screen show, um, is seen through your eyes. It appears as if our senses mirror the physical reality quite well, yet on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, our senses only provide rudimentary and ambiguous information. For example, the visual information the brain receives from your eyes looks far more like this. 
And the pressure receptors in your hand send the same signal whether you, your partner, or your dog sits on your hand. So the big question in perception research is, if our senses are not that good, how does the brain generate the clear percept of the world we consciously experience? My response is by combining different pieces of information. The tactile sensors in your hand indicate that pressure is exerted on your hand. The proprioceptive sensors in your joints and muscles provide information about your current body posture. And this information is consistent with the possibility that your body is actually waiting on your hand. Of course, you can look down your body and even though you can't see your hand, all the information you get is consistent with the hypothesis that you yourself are sitting on your hand. And you might be aware that the dog is not allowed on the sofa and thus rule out that he is sitting on your hand. And of course, you will remember that you just sat down on your hand when I asked you to do so. The brain combines these and other pieces of information into the distinct percept you're right now having that you are sitting on your hand. The idea that perception of the world relies on a combination of sensory and prior information is already about 140 years old. But only in the last decade did researchers start to scrutinize the mathematical principles that govern this integration. In my lab, we investigate these calculations and the components with a special focus on the perception of the body. So, how does this relate to the BrainGate technology? What BrainGate does is it translates thought into action. For example, it allows paralyzed patients to control movements of a robot arm by thinking about the movement. In the same way, patients could control the movements of a prosthetic hand, an exoskeleton, or their own paralyzed muscles. Under natural circumstances, action and perception are inherently coupled. Our percepts guide our actions and our actions trigger new percepts. For example, when we grasp a bottle, we use our senses of touch and proprioception and vision to perfectly adjust the grip and neither squash or drop the bottle. The brain technology has the potential to emulate this tight coupling between action and perception by creating artificial sensations through brain stimulation. Research in this direction has already started. When we think about creating sensations through brain stimulation, the slightly depressing facts I told you in the beginning about the shortcomings of our sensory system turn into good news. If we can tap into the calculations the brain is built to do, the combination of information across different senses and with prior knowledge, very little ambiguous information in one sense can go a long way towards a naturalistic percept of a thought controlled movement. In the beginning, I asked you to sit on your hand because doing so might temporarily affect your perception. Your hand now might feel numb or tingle and you might not have full control over it. Your tactile and proprioceptive perception might be interrupted. You can use your other hand to manipulate the numb hand, but these movements probably feel strange and robot-like. Keep this feeling in mind while your sensations return and your movements feel normal again. The BrainGate technology has the potential to give patients this normalcy of perceiving the effects of their actions. And I hope that this little demo illustrated the difference this technology can make. And with this, I thank you for your attention and Jeff for his generous gift and hand it over to Jean. That was wonderful. Thank you, Stephanie. My name is Gina Kuperberg and I'm the Dennett Steibel Professor of Cognitive Science and I direct the Neurocognition of Language Lab here at Tufts and at Mass General Hospital. I'm also here today to tell you a bit about my research and how I see it linking to BrainGate. My research program aims to understand perhaps the most powerful and uniquely human of brain functions, language. Now, being able to 
produce and comprehend language so that we can communicate with one another feels effortless, at least most of the time it does. But in fact, the neurobiological mechanisms underlying language processing are incredibly complex. And when these mechanisms break down, which can happen in many different ways in many different types of neurological disorders, ranging from stroke to locked in syndrome, the consequences can be devastating, leaving people isolated and unable to communicate with each other. So as you've already heard today, BrainGate is a powerful brain computer interface that can record neural activity directly from inside the brain and send this activity to a computer which decodes the motor intention and converts it into a signal that can control an external device. Now, as Stephanie just mentioned, this device could be a robotic arm, which would enable someone with locked-in syndrome to carry out movements that otherwise they wouldn't be able to perform on their own. It might also be a computer cursor, which would allow someone with locked-in syndrome to spell out words so that they can actually communicate with other people. Now, the brain activity that's traditionally recorded using brain-computer interfaces like BrainGate are the signals that produce motor action. And these signals are produced by just one specific part of the brain, the motor cortex, which I've shown here in the slide. However, when the brain processes language, it produces this type of motor activity only at the very final stage of a very complex set of computations. And these language processing mechanisms engage many different parts of the brain, producing very complex patterns of neural activity that depend on the meaning of what we're trying to say. So for example, even when we read a single word, like the word baby, the brain activates multiple different regions that encode the particular sets of semantic features that define a baby. For example, the fact that a baby is small and human. And together, these brain regions produce a unique and widespread pattern of activity that's distinct from the pattern of activity that's produced when we read a different word, like, for example, rose. And so what we'd really like a brain computer interface to be able to do for someone who can't communicate by themselves is not just to decode the motor activity that their brains produce, but to decode the whole pattern of activity and use this pattern more directly to generate words and sentences that can be communicated to others. Now, this may seem futuristic, but in this recent paper, the researchers showed that this type of direct language decoding is at least in principle possible. What they did was to record patterns of neural activity from electrodes that were implanted in widespread areas of the brain as people read sentences. And then using sophisticated AI methods, they decoded this neural signal so that they could figure out what these sentences were. Now, in this particular study, it was possible to measure brain activity directly from the surface of people's brains because these patients already had electrodes implanted because they were being monitored for neurological conditions. But having a neurosurgeon actually open up the skull to insert electrodes over so much of the brain may be too invasive in every situation. And so in the future, what we'd like to be able to do is to record neural activity non-invasively. In other words, we'd like to record patterns of activity that are produced by the brain, but instead of actually opening up the skull and implanting electrodes directly on the brain itself, we'd like to record these patterns of activity from sensors that we place at the surface of the skull. And this is exactly what my own lab does. We use non-invasive multimodal neuroimaging tools, EEG, MEG, and fMRI, to measure brain activity as people process language. We're particularly interested in how the brain uses context to predict what words are going to come next during language comprehension. 
For example, in one recent study, we tracked the brain activity produced millisecond by millisecond when people encountered words that they had predicted, following context like, inside the crib, there was a tiny baby. Understanding the role of prediction in language processing is really important because when we communicate, we talk quickly. And so it's only by predicting ahead that the brain is actually able to keep up. Now, it used to be thought that the brain activity that we measure at the surface of the skull is too distorted and blurry to be able to use it to distinguish between different words. But what we've recently shown is that during word by word sentence comprehension, we can detect at the surface of the scalp unique patterns of brain activity that are associated with the specific words that people predict before these words actually appear. For example, after reading the sentence context inside the crib, there was a tiny, before people actually see the next word baby, we were able to detect a specific spatial and temporal pattern of neural activity that corresponded to the prediction of this word. And we were able to show that this pattern was distinct from the pattern that the brain produced after reading a different sentence context that predicted a different word, Rose. We're really excited about these findings because they suggest a future direction for brain-computer interface research. In addition to using these interfaces to record neural activity directly from inside the brain, and decoding the motor activity to control a cursor to spell out words letter by letter. It may actually be possible in the future to record whole spatial and temporal patterns of neural activity non-invasively from the surface of the skull and to use these patterns to decode words and sentences in order to help people with numerous different types of language disorders to communicate with one another. Thank you so much. Um, I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank Jeff Steibel and his team for this wonderful gift. Um, and with that, I'll hand it back to the panel. All right. Thank you very much, Stephanie and, and Gina. So welcome back to our, our live uh, Q&A part of, of today's program. Uh, we, we have the, the pleasure to be joined by the magic of technology by uh, Dan Dennett uh, in, in, the, uh, in the flesh. Uh, who is going to join our panel uh, for a series of um, questions that have been submitted by uh, uh, the, uh, our audience. Um, and we've got a considerable number of questions and the panel has agreed to stay just a little bit longer past five to try and answer them. That said, we do want to be respectful of your time. And so if you need to leave, we understand that. We have recorded the event, so you can return to see it in its entirety. So if you do need to leave, uh, thank you for your time and, and your uh, attention. So uh, we'll just start at the top. One of the one of the, the first questions. Okay, we're going to put chips in the brain. Have have people given thought as to how we might be able to do that less invasively uh, than uh, than uh, direct surgical manipulations? Todd, I, you've probably given this a fair amount of thought. Uh, did you ask that to me, Bob? <laughs> yes. You know, I, I, I think, I, I, yeah, I, I think that what, as Jeff alluded to from the very beginning, what we can achieve with BrainGate um, by putting something into the brain is going to be far more um, superior from a fidelity standpoint than what we can achieve um, from the ex from the surface of the scalp. But what we saw with Gina is, um, and with our work so far at Emotive, is that there is still a lot you can do uh, from a, a non-invasive standpoint. And so I see those these technologies as being complementary. The more we know about what happens inside the brain allows us to inform um, how we might be able to use non-invasive methods in a much more um, precise way because we just understand more of the system and how it works. And so we can build better machine learning models that can predict more accurately. So I think that these systems can be very complementary um, over time and hopefully for things that are not, for the degrees of uh, control that is not so critical, we may be able to use non-invasive um, forms of technology and then for mission critical things, um, you know, defer to the more invasive types of technology. So it will be a blend. You don't have to necessarily use uh, fully implantable um, implants for, for, to solve everything. 
Yes, it, 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 uh, it somewhat goes back to the, the um, uh, some thoughts I've had about driverless cars. I always wondered how we would have driverless cars. How would we would ever give it up uh, driving because of the self-control that you have? But it's perfectly clear it's going to be gradual and the cars are just going to get progressively smarter and smarter and smarter. And at some point, we'll be very comfortable with letting go of the wheel. So a couple of other questions from our, our, our audience um, are more on the, on, the, on the dark side. One is, uh, are there dangers in this technology that it can be hacked or uh, could it lead to control um, uh, of people with these kinds of implants? Does anybody want to try and um, take on that particular I, I mean, question? I, 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 I'm happy to take it broadly. With, with, I think with any new technology, there, there are dangers. Uh, and, you know, anything that is being applied directly to, you know, to our biology uh, feels more threatening, more invasive than others. So I think we have to tread lightly. We have to be careful um, about those. But, you know, for better or worse, we, we have already lost our privacy. We have already lost our autonomy. Um, that, that has been long gone. And, you know, you, your, your concept of that slippery slope, Bob, um, it's it's us old people who are holding on to that notion that you know driverless cars well it'll slowly go away really it's just that next generation that doesn't grow up with it um, just thinks we're old people um, and uh, I think you know that that has largely happened when you look at the context of most of the technology as it has kind of materialized and you know and, and become part of us become one with us and if you just think about like proprioception and how we use tools. Um, it, it is it is very difficult um, to, from the outside in to tell where you know where the limb ends and the prosthetic or you know or other technological device begins and we we will probably have that with you know with BrainGate as well. Okay, so um, the uh, a companion question along the same lines is uh, one of uh, one of our. Um, uh, audience uh, worries about uh, what happens when uh, DARPA comes knocking on our door to try and win wars with uh, computer enhanced soldiers. Uh, um, uh, Mike, I, I, you I know have had some, some interactions with DARPA. Do you have particular views on this? Yeah, um, we, we have we have a number of uh, relationships with DARPA and, you know, DARPA has, uh, so the Department of Defense has a massive breast cancer program. They uh, develop lots of technologies that end up uh, being uh, incredibly useful for uh, health and various other applications in the public sector. I think I think we have to uh we have to um, um make our peace with the fact that almost any invention of any type i mean the wright brothers uh, you know setting bones you know anything you can imagine that makes life better somebody's going to come up with some way to use it in conflict okay i think that's that's inevitable and so i think the answer to this is not to squash down um uh, development and innovation the answer is to uh, be be really uh, transparent and take uh, solid control of how our technology is being used and the resources that we allow people to use in the way they deploy these things. So, so DARPA does, uh, so for example, one project we had had to do with limb regeneration. And so, of course, they're thinking about uh, uh, repairing uh, you know, repairing people who um, who have been injured in in various kinds of uh, military engagements, but you know, massive numbers of, of of civilians are walking around with limb loss and with various other uh, ailments that are just you know uh, a, a real um, a real drain on their quality of life and on the economy. And so, these kind of advances are essential for for making life and health span better for everybody. And uh, we we need to keep an eye on how they're used, but uh, there's no there's no road for for squashing innovation. I also think to to Mike's point, I think war may end up changing over time as well, because at the end of the day, as Professor Dennett said very precisely, um, control of your attention and the things that people care about controlling will evolve. It won't necessarily just be about killing people because the, the, the value to that is going to be very limited. And so it would be new forms of warfare around how do you have better control over people's mind share uh, and other forms of, of war. And that's the kind of things that we, you know, I think 
what Jeff is doing in terms of putting BrainGate into the, the, the space for academics and scholars and ethicists to really think about the unintended consequences of technology allows us to think about this broader question of how does this technology evolve over time and how will societies um, and our values change over time as a result of some of these enabling tools. So, so Dan, uh, one of our audience members uh, is curious about artificial intelligence and, and really asks a, a fundamental question of machines. Will they ever achieve the human ability for creativity and discovery? And I, I, I know you've given a lot of thought to this question. Yes, uh, um, I have. And I think the imagined super AI, the uh, super intelligent AI system that many people think is just around the corner. I think it's still decades away uh, and it's a good thing that it is. <clears throat> real, real creativity, real creative thought uh, uh, depends on uh, a mind having goals, having, having agendas having also uh, the idea of exploring its own knowledge, looking for novelty and prizing novelty in certain ways. And although I think it's absolutely possible, uh, I haven't seen any work in AI yet, which is making much progress on this. Um, the machine learning is making some wonderful I think of them as fabrics. Uh, they're wonderfully smart fabrics, but they don't have the architecture for uh, creative thought yet. They're they're very uh, actually they're very passive. They're very dependent on uh, the knowledge that has been acquired by creative minds <laughs> uh, up till now. I think it's possible. I think we should. Uh, hope that it takes a long time because we have a lot of, of uh, thinking to do about whether we, how we want to control this. And m my favorite way of alerting people to the issues is uh, a really super intelligent agent is autonomous in a way that you and I are. And imagine if you were whisked away somewhere and woke up to discover that there now were some people who had control of your on off button. Uh, and they could simply turn you off, either put you to sleep or, or stop you in your tracks anytime they wanted. Uh, I don't know about you, but my first order of business would be to figure out how to rest control of the on off button away from those people. Uh, I would devote all my creative intelligence to figuring out how to uh, snooker them into giving me access to those controls. I'd want to get out of their control. So we have to recognize that if we start making AIs that are that autonomous, they're going to be more autonomous than we want. And, and, and so, the irony uh, is because I, I tend to I tend to agree with Dan that we're we're a long ways off from that. But to to pull on that analogy a little bit further, I suspect we're probably already there. And it's not with AI that's pulling our attention and tugging on our on-off button. It's you know it, it's the internet and you know and what companies have done to exploit it and you know and take control of our minds. And uh, and we should all be in high alert. I think I think Dan's right. Okay, a couple of our audience, uh, I see so, some very positive benefits of this. Uh, they talk about, uh, could, could this kind of brain gate technology be applied to, uh, to cochlear implants? Does it have some implications for maybe helping people with, uh, with, with issues related to mental health? Um, do, we, do we see those possibilities here? Sure. Oh, yeah, the potential, no, of potential, of course, is there. I mean, again, we're we're talking about data, so you know, the more data you can get about how the mind 
um, is interacting at the cellular level, uh, the, the more you're going to be able to leverage that for good. Uh, one, one question we have also asks, uh, could we create gut gate? Uh, is there some way that we could develop a technology that would help us to uh, uh, control uh, uh, our, our uh, internal health uh, related to, 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 to digestion and, and, and food? And uh, Mike, I know you've worried a little bit about uh, the, the impact of, of gut microbiomes on, uh, on behavior. Is this, the, it, it, at first it, it, it is, it's an interesting take on, on uh, a play on words, but it has deeper implications, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, we, you know, we tend to think of ourselves as this um, kind of single unified uh, intelligence, but the reality is we're a patchwork of different modules that are that are having various kinds of inputs that all together result in our behavior and not only our own cells, but you know, we're host to a whole bunch of uh, microbiota that live in this in this community of cells and that have an impact of both on the structure and the function of the organism. And so uh, understanding these electrical signals, yeah, we, we've seen how bacteria impact the bioelectric decisions that uh, cells in the body are undertaking to create nervous systems and, and so on. Um, this, this technology will, and, and others like it, will be essential to understanding how all of these things work together to form what we call a person. Well, we've uh, we've uh, gone over by by uh, our allotted time, and so um, I'll bring this really interesting conversation to a close. Uh, we have uh, lots of questions. We've hoped that you have found tonight uh, as stimulating uh, as as obviously the the panelists have. So, thank you for joining us for tonight's event. I want to thank uh, each of our panelists for their contributions. Uh, we hope you've found tonight informative, and that it makes clear that. Exciting things are afoot here at, at Tufts University as we advance into the heart of the 21st century. So we will work hard to make sure that you stay informed of these and other exciting developments at the university. And so we'll bring our proceedings to a close. I want to thank you and, and, and uh, wish you a good night.